settle down, class. I brought in the big telly today because we're going to learn all about computers. Let's start with a song. What? Pink? Pink's not on the rainbow. Certainly not on this rainbow. What colour is it? Come on. Come on, class. Come on. You there. Please, sir. I cannot tell a lie. It's magenta. Magenta was invented in 1860 in, in London and was named after That's the enough Battle for of now. Magenta when Napoleon... Let's crack on. If you were the proud owner of a ZX Spectrum 48K, you would get hold of the Horizons tape that came with it. It didn't come immediately with it on first release, but came shortly afterwards. And the Horizons tape was from Scion Software. And it taught you about how to use the Spectrum. We're looking at side A here. And after getting the volume sorted out on the uh, tape recorder, it goes through the hardware of the computer, all the different bits, the ROM, the RAM, the Z80 CPU, and the ULA, the keyboard, the TV, the loudspeaker, and the tape recorder. Output devices are the TV and the loudspeaker. delight that is. The ZX Spectrum keyboard is laid out like a typewriter. So your standard QWERTY typewriter with numbers at the top, nice and simple, except you don't enter BASIC that way. It's based on a keyword system, which is a little tricky to understand if you're unfamiliar with it, because on the keys though are written all the different instructions. So the letter I is the letter I, also at input code and in, based on which mode you're in, which is not the same as a keyboard, just has uppercase or not perhaps. The Horizon tape would help with this because it has an interactive test. Assume the Spectrum is expecting a basic keyword and then press the appropriate key. So enter go to, and I got it wrong here. You stupid boy. Go to is the letter G. I press copy. Now here I am typing in a very simple program in 48K mode. It's not quite synced up, but I'm using my ZX Spectrum 128K plus two, which note does not have most of the keyboard shortcuts on the keys. So when I'm typing the cursor, when it syncs up, changes between K for keyword mode, L for lowercase. Um, here we are, extend mode. So I'm typing in various combinations and it gets a bit extreme. The bonus of the 128K plus two is you get dedicated keys for going into extend mode, going into caps lock and for going into graphics mode. You have to know what the keys are. Beep, for example, is extend mode, symbol shift, Z. If you don't know that, you're going to find out quick. Or you look it up in the manual, which is not as intuitive. So as a new basic programmer, I do not recommend doing code in 48K basic. I recommend using 128K basic. You still have to worry about these modes though, which are mainly for capital letters, extended mode for certain characters and graphics characters, which are at the top of the screen. So this is what 128K mode looks like. The cursor still exists, but it's just flashing blue and white. And here I have to type the word print, which then becomes the keyword print. This does mean there are some limitations. You can't have a variable called print because that just won't work. So typing print is slower because you have to type the five letters. Typing border is slower. Typing beep is quicker. At the end, there is a little interactive lookup table which tells you where to find it in the manual. So what does, what does print do? It's in chapter two. It's a command. And it's used to display items on the screen. Nice and simple. And the manual for 128 8K plus two does actually have all the keyboard shortcuts in the manual, so you can look them up. 
or there's a website you can visit called slady.net, which has an interactive keyboard thing, or you can buy a mug from the Computer Museum and use that. But generally speaking, I would say use 128k mug. But for now, turn the tape over and we'll look at side B. Now class, we're going to learn about real world physics and apply this to our game. So get out your textbooks. Yo, sir, I don't understand this. That's because you got the book upside down. Oh. Yo, sir, I still don't understand this. This is side B of Horizons with Through the Wall. The first bit is just tells you all about other Scion products, but you load Through the Wall and it works fine. If you're interested in loading it in 128k mode, do not do that. It doesn't work because Through the Wall uses machine code and that does not play well with the 128k spectrum. However, it was designed for the 48k spectrum or the 16k spectrum and it's a basic program showing how you can program your own real-time games on the spectrum using simple basic. The keys are P to move right, O to move left. If you hold cap shift down as well, you go at double the speed, so two spaces instead of one. Press any key to start. Let's have a look at Through the Wall. And I've died straight away. And that's the only sound we get. But the ball moves a fair lick. The two control options are nice because you've got, the, you know, if it was just at standard speed, you'd be in trouble. Because you get to move in turbo mode occasion, it's quite nice. The ball moves around, it bounces. Different directions, it goes around the top. There's no indication of your score, no indication of your lives. It is completely and utterly silent. But it's quite fun. Lots of colours on the screen. The bricks are attractive. The five colours, yellow, green, pink, red and blue. If you can't tell the difference between pink and magenta, it's no wonder you're all still here in my school, even though you're all clearly middle-aged. We are quite passive at the bottom until the ball comes back to us. I've sped the game up so you can see more what's going on. And this is a bit more of an issue. As there are less and less blocks, you spend more of the time waiting for the ball to come back to you and not hitting yeah. things. The ball goes in either diagonally up or just straight up. There are no gradations of direction. Get out your exercise books and make some notes on how to make this game better. Yeah. Gets a bit dull. Some people have joked that it's the true sign of willpower is uh, trying to clear the screen in Horizons, because it can take forever. At a certain point, you have no control over where the ball goes. You can't make the ball move one over. And that is the end. We're going to select No, then I'm going to show you how you can get hold of the source code, so we can investigate how we can make it better. You've just played through the wall, and now we're going to make it better. The first thing we need to do is get access to the listing. So when you get to the do you want to play again screen, you just select N to play again. Do not play again, press no. So start the tape. If you then break by using uh, cap shift and space, you get to see the listing. So from here, we could look through the listing line at a time and see what's going on. But a more sensible way of doing it is to get an actual printout. The way you use printer is the to use the list. Yo, sir! It says the list. Is we in Wales and that? And you get the list by doing extend mode V. If you're using Spectaculator, do make sure that the ZX printer option is selected. And do be aware, if you change hardware options in Spectaculator, it will then reset the spectrum. So be very careful doing this. But make sure the printer is active. Then you do the list, which is like list, but goes to the printer instead. And to see the output, you have to go to the view option. I then select ZX printer and I have here the print, out, printer output. You don't have to print it, but it certainly is there. I'm going to print that and I'm using a print it to a PDF. I use a PDF writer, which is free. I've made the PDF available via Jim Blimey's website. And we can see the listing. There's a bit of 
crap at the top line, but that's not nothing to worry about. We can see what we've got the listing, we've got the graphics characters, we've got our UDGs in place, and at the end we've got the strange save stuff we'll look at later. Red and yellow, I'm going to show you how to turn through the wall from what we have to start with into this. We've got sound, we've got colour, we've got multi-ball. We've also got the score at the bottom and how many times we've cleared. And I'm going to take you through this step by step. Let's start by looking at the programme. We see at the top, let TT equals minus one. What does it do? We don't know. We don't care. Don't stress about it. Line 20 sets up the screen. Border five gives us a cyan border, sets some things up, clears the screen, and then we've got a couple of loops. And what those loops do, the four statements, they display the bricks on the screen. We're leaving them alone. First thing we're going to do is have the border change colour based on the lives. The lives is controlled by the loop line 50, which is for R equals 1 to 6. The border command can be found on the B key. That's B for Bravo. We're going to set the border to the colour 6 minus R, which means we'll start off with a cyan border. And then as we lose our lives, we'll go down to a black border at the end. So here we are. We started off cyan border just as before. We've now lost a life, gone down to green, then to magenta, then to red, we've got two lives left, blue, one life left, this is our last life of black, and then it's game over. Bottom two lines remain cyan, which can look, does look a bit odd. What we're going to do, is going to use that area, which is the input area, to display the score. So line 51, we're going to print hash, which is symbol shift 3, semicolon, at 0, 0, which will be in the, it'll be in the input area, the score. And the score is made up of two variables, t, which is the score for the current level, and tt, which is the number of times you've gone through the wall. Hit 600 points each time you clear. So we're going to put both these variables here with a comma between them. And we need to put this in two places. Line 51 is every time we clear the screen on after losing a life. But line 250, that's where we actually increase our score when we hit a block. So we want to be, see our score increasing every time we hit a block. So this looks nice. The score goes up. We've lost a life. This is all fine. Oh, ugh, that's a bit ugly. The background's gone really, really nasty. It matches the border, but the rest of it doesn't match the border. That's horrible. So to fix that, we are going to hard code the ink and paper colours. So to get into ink, which is extend mode, and then symbol shift X, ink zero is black. And we want paper, which is extend mode, symbol shift C for paper. Paper five is cyan. And then we copy this with the edit command, which is cap shift one. And that's going to be line 251. Note score is six, it's T plus 600 times TT. And now let's just make sure it all looks fine. It did before though. It's a tricky beast. Lose a life. Let's hit another block, make sure we're okay. Yeah, this is all good. This is the basic structure of Through the Wall. We've got a main sub main area called line 60 to 90. And then we call these subroutines for moving the ball. There are six subroutines based on the direction of the ball. What we want to do is add a sound when the ball hits a brick. So let's look at one of these subroutines. And we find that on line 112, we look at the Atra keyword. And the Atra keyword tells you what the colour is of a square on the screen. So what it's saying is if the colour on the screen is anything other than 56, which is black ink white paper, then go sub to 250. So we're going to go look at 250. And we see 250, we add something to the score based on the attribute divided by 8, so essentially the colour of the paper. Then we add stuff to the score. What we want to do is add a little beep. So we're going to add a line here, 
Line 253. So we'll slot in. We've got a bit of a gap. And beep is extend mode. Symbol shift Z. And we're going to beep for one hundredth of a second. Nice and short. And I'm going to beep the actual attribute value. Which will be nice and high. It'll, a very short beep. Because when you're beeping. You can't do anything else. So a little chirp there. But a different note, depending on what cut, what the colour of the brick you hit is. We're going to add some more sound. We want a small beep when we hit the bat. So the beep 0 0.01, 0 is a beep of one hundredth of a second at middle C. When do we hit the bat? Looking at these subroutines for going down, this is subroutine 100. We want M, which is the row it's on, to be 20. But that's just that could be include the ball missing. So there are three lines on each subroutine which govern, is the ball close to the bat? So each subroutine has three lines you need to change. These are changing lines, not inserting lines. I've listed them here for your convenience. But essentially what we need to do is, so if the, this point, if the ball is directly above the left of the bat, we do a little beep and then we carry on. So all about is the ball near the bat. So this is the nether subroutine. So there are three lines in each because the ball could be going straight down, could be going down and left, or could be going down and right. Let's now add a beep when we hit the wall. So each left or right subroutine detects the walls. And there are four lines you need to change, listed on the screen here. And it's all about the variable n. So if it's greater than 30, we've hit a wall. So we put a little beep in. And we're going for beep 0 0.01. But going for minus 12 now, which is the C below middle C. So it's a lower beep. And while we're at it, let's also detect the ceiling. So each up subroutine, there are three of them, detects the ceiling. These three lines need to change. 125, 140, 180. So if M is less than 1, we hit the ceiling. So we beat 0 0.01 and we're going to have a different note, minus 24, which is two C's below. Let's check it out. Marvellous. We've done a lot of good work here. So let's save what we've done. Now you'd think you do that by doing save wall like you would any other program. Or if you wanted to auto start, you do save wall line 300. Line is got by extend mode symbol shift 3. That's a mistake because through the wall is an odd program. Here's the setup bit and here's what you would normally expect to find. The setting up of user defined graphics. So what you need to do is actually listed at the end of the program. Fortunately, you just save the program, then save the user defined graphics and then save the machine code used to display the score and stuff on the screen. You don't have to remember these commands though, because you can just go to. Before we do that though, we're going to change the program to not just say load the next game. So we're going to change line 8000, say goodbye, go to 3000 and then go to 9999. That's now save to tape by going to 99990. It saves the program. Then the user defined graphics, which are the bricks and the ball and the bat. Then the machine code to get the nice big messages and the score. And then at the end you get this on the screen. This is on your tape through the wall after part one. Don't get it wrong or you'll get 48 of the best. We're not going to add power ups, but they're not on all the time. We're going to get the power up by hitting a special flashing brick. Now to add a flashing brick, we're putting in a new line in the brick creations area, line 35. So if M is 3 and N is 16, which is just about the middle of the wall, we're adding a new brick, which is going to be magenta, but it's going to be flashing. And we need to use the graphics characters QE, of which the letters here, because they're not uh, sequential, as you might expect, but it's graphics mode QE to get the brick. Now this will give us a flashing brick. This is a good thing. Unfortunately, it also breaks the game. I'll show you how. You run the game, the ball goes fine, it goes up, it goes up, it goes up. It hits the brick and we get B integer out of range on line 253. Now line 253 is the beep command. 
So what you've unfortunately done, A, you've broken the beep, the beep command because the note we're calling is much, much too high. You can go up to a 69.9. We've also broken the score. We're going to change line 250 to insert a call to a new subroutine at line 2000. We've not written this yet, but we're about to do it now. What is subroutine 2000? The first thing we're going to do is if C, which is the attribute of the brick we've hit, is less than 128, if it's not flashing, then just return. If it is flashing, we subtract 128 from the attribute, which make make it not, not flashing anymore, and then return. All this does is set us up so we can do stuff later. Let's make sure it works. Absolutely tickety-boo. We're now going to implement a sticky bat mechanic. We're going to do that so if it's active and you're pressing symbol shift O or P, showing here what the characters are, symbol shift O is semicolon, symbol shift P is quote mark, then the bat might be sticky and the ball will stick to the bat until you release it. So line 87, we're saying if the key you press is symbol shift P, which is the quote mark, because it's a quote mark within a quote mark, we have to double it up, go sub 229, which is one before the going right subroutine. Doing the same thing for the semicolon, which is symbol shift O, one before the going left subroutine. So 219, so if sticky, which is a new variable we've not defined yet, and the ball is on row 20, and it's hitting the bat, so the difference between N, where the ball is, and A, where the left of the bat is, is between 0 and 2, then we're on the bat. Then we're going to move the ball to the left, because the ball is sticking to the bat. The bat moves to the left, so does the ball. And we're changing the ball direction subroutine to 1000. Doing the same thing for going to the right. The new subroutine 1000, all that does is change the subroutine in turn to either 120 or 140. But it does not move the ball up or down. The ball will stay stuck to the bat. We're now going to put a display here when the sticky bat is activated. We're using the print hash zero to use the input area, printing at one comma zero at the very bottom of the screen. Paper five, cyan, ink three, magenta, flash one, so it's flashing. We're spacing out the characters to say we've got sticky bat. And by doing that, it looks quite nice. We have to make sure you use the full width of the line. So make sure you get the quote marks lining up. So when it activates, we'll print sticky bat. We need to turn the variable sticky that we've not really defined yet to one. This means it's true. So you can use variables like booleans and then we're going to return. What we need to do is actually define sticky though at the start. So for each level, sticky is off and let's make sure it works. Sticky bat is now active and we've lost a life. However, it's active for the whole level. By holding symbol shift and moving left and right, the ball will stay stuck on the bat, bat wibbling wobbling up and down until such time as you release. The last thing we're going to do is to add multi-ball support. This is the most complex thing we're going to do. You can have long variable names, but don't make them too long because they get difficult to type out. So originally I called this variable multi-ball to indicate multi-ball. Yeah, that gets old really quick. Just call it multi. We start off with multi set to zero, it's off. We want to let you know when it's activated, so we copy line 2100 to line 2200 and say it's multi-ball. Here's the actual activation. We're using multi-ball by using a set of arrays. We are only going to have two balls, but we need to have arrays for the five variables controlling the ball. G is the subroutine, U and V are the old location, M and N are the current location, and we declare arrays in Spectrum Basic with the dim statement, which is keyword on D. We're then going to initialize these arrays, which we're initializing these arrays with the current values of the ball. So G1 and G2 are going to be G, UI and U2 are going to be U, and so on. We want the second ball to have a different direction to the first. We want this to be a random direction. So we're going to set the second direction to be either 120 or 140. However, if it's the same as what we currently have, then try it again. And then finally, we're turning multiple on by setting it to number one. And finally, returning. But how do we actually chain uh, activate this when we hit the brick? 
I'm changing line 2020 to be, if it's less than 0.5, go to 2100. There are other ways of doing it. You could have it so it varies level by level. And if it's not less than 0.5, then go sub 2200 to activate multi-ball. Here's why we're doing this array nonsense. Line 65 calls a subroutine and then prints a space. We don't want to change these six subroutines because I'm a lazy, lazy man. So what I'm doing instead is the line before called the subroutine. I am transferring the value of the array into the current variable. So g multi becomes g, u multi becomes u, and so on. And after we finish calling the subroutine, we then need to store the current values back into the array. At the end of this, we add one to multi. So multi now becomes two. And if multi is less than three, we then go back to line 60. So we do the both balls. Once we hit multi num is three, then we just carry on because we've moved both balls. And if multi is three, we need to reset multi back to one. This is okay, except we now made the game a lot harder because if either ball goes off the bottom of the screen, then you lose a life. So what we're gonna do is intercept here. So 240 is a beep when you lose a ball. We still want that, but if we've got multi-ball active, print a space where the current ball is, set multi to be the opposite of what it currently is. So if it's one, then multi is two. If it's two, then multi is one. We then store the variables back to where they were, turn multi-ball off and print space at the bottom. And here is multi-ball active. Unfortunately, the balls are going opposite directions of the screen. So I've lost Oh, both of them, because I am truly shit. All source and programs are available via Jim Blimey's website. You can type them in, you can play both versions. Do give it a go. We require an education. No snarky comments on the YouTube. Stalkers teach us for the load. Ho ho! Stalkers! Don't just hide me load! All in all, it's just that. Another ball the wall. All in all is just a, another ball through the wall.